<clears throat> you had to put a title on this this morning. It's the river begins at the cross. The river begins at the cross. <clears throat> Acts chapter 3 and uh, verse 18. But those things which God had before shown by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Everybody said fulfilled. Everything that Jesus is ever going to do, except for his coming back, <laughs> has been fulfilled. Everything prophetically has been fulfilled in what he would do to bring forth deliverance for all of mankind. Okay? you Everybody, you understand you're set free. You're set free. Jesus isn't going to come and do it again. He already did it. The victory's already been won. We fight from victory to victory to victory to victory, from faith to faith, from glory to glory. Amen? Okay? So everything has been done. You need to understand that. Okay? So repent, therefore. Remember, we talked about all these different meanings. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which is God, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. We covered all of those instances and we when we left off on the area of restitution. Remember I gave you an example out of Joshua chapter 3 concerning when the children of Israel were going to cross on over the Jordan River to go into the promised land. Remember that the instructions <clears throat> from the Lord to Moses was to have the priest to bear the Ark of the Covenant upon their shoulders. And when the toes of the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant dipped into the waters of Jordan, the Scripture says that the waters rolled back. Okay? And uh, you need to understand it's not like the crossing of the Red Sea where the waters were parted. But when they crossed the Jordan River, the Scripture says that the waters of the Jordan were rolled back. And it was during the time of the harvest, or of the flood season. So we know that the River of Jordan wasn't just a trickle. It was overflowing its banks even at the time. So you need to stop and think about what this looks like. But what I want you to see is that the Scripture declares in Joshua chapter 3 that when the waters of the Jordan were rolled back, it said they rolled them all the way back to Adam. Now, you need to get a picture of this in case you forgot it or you weren't here for that, is that remember the Ark of the Covenant, remember the lid of that, of that uh, Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled with the blood. And we know that that whole thing shows as a type of the blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ. And when it entered into that water, and it says that, when the priests dipped their feet into the water, that word dipped is an Old Testament term for baptism. So we find here that is that blood-stained Ark of the Covenant entered into the Jordan River. It represented or was a typology of when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. And remember the scripture says that when we were baptized with Jesus, we were baptized into his death. And we were raised with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Romans chapter 6 teaches us that. So we find here that when the, they entered in, it was a picture of the shedding of Christ's blood on the cross and him being baptized into his death and then being resurrected from the dead. So we find that there is a completeness of what happens when that took place, when Christ died on the cross, he was resurrected from the dead in shedding of his blood. It rolled back the waters of death of all of humanity all the way, because remember the Jordan flowed into the Dead Sea. So it shows here that it rolled back all of the death of humanity all the way back to Adam. So when that took place, that was a restitution 
of man's position with God, which brings us to the point of bring, being brought back into the place of our kingdom authority that we need to be walking in in this earth today. Now, maybe you understand the church has been shy on that. People have been embarrassed because they didn't know whether God would heal or whether the miracle would take place. That's not faith. When you pray, when you believe God, you, you believe that person's going to get raised up. That person's going to get healed. That person's going to get set free. Religion has talked us out of those things. And I believe that the restitution of all things, because he's already taken care of man's sin, Jesus became healing for all of us. He became poor so that we could become rich. He did this on the cross in Galatians chapter 3. He became what? A curse for us. For the scripture says, Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree, so that the blessings of Abraham could come upon them that believe. So we know that everything concerning the curse has been done away with. It's been rolled back to Adam. So the thing that God is waiting for, the restitution of it, is the authority of the church to rise up once again. That's where we're standing at today. And so uh, there's another picture that I would really like you to see because the river begins at the cross. Remember when that uh, Ark of the Covenant went into the river that was the cross, and the river was rolled back. So now the river begins, the river of the Holy Ghost, the river and the outpouring, of the outflow of the life of God into us begins at the cross. Now go with me to Exodus chapter 17. We're going to look at a couple of different scriptures. I hope you brought your Bible with you today and marked it up and all this kind of stuff. I know you did. Trust in you did. We're going to go to Psalms after this. But Exodus chapter 17, and beginning in verse 5. Very familiar portion of Scripture. Look what it says. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, take with you the elders of Israel, and the rod wherein you smote the river, take it in your hand and go. In other words, take the authority of God with you. <laughs> right? Okay? Wherever you go, take the authority of God. Behold, I will stand before you on the rock in Horeb, and you shall smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now go with me to Psalm, if you would. Psalm 78. Sixteen, he brought streams also out of the, the rock. Everybody say, the rock. Okay, so it's a specific, isn't it? It's not a rock, it's the rock. Okay, he brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. Verse 16, or verse 20, I'm sorry. Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. How many of you understand that's a lot of water? It wasn't somebody just turning on a hose bib and running a little bit of water. This thing was like a torrential amount of water. If you can imagine the old flood from the, uh, what year was that, 64, whenever the uh, Rogue River overflowed. You can imagine water, something like that, just coming out of this rock. Okay, now go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud, passed through the sea. They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they did all eat the same spiritual meat, did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So are we all on the same page in understanding that this rock that was smitten in the, des in the desert that Moses 
hit with the rod of authority that that rock was a type and a shadow, a picture of Jesus Christ. Would we all understand that? Okay, by these scriptures, okay? So I just needed you to understand, okay? <clears throat> so there is a word there that's very important that you grab a hold of in the Hebrew, okay? When Moses smote the rock or when the rock was smitten, these different words interchange, smite, smote, smit, smitten, comes from the Hebrew word nakah. In the English spelling of that is N-A-W-K-A-W, N-A-W-K-A-W. That's the English spelling of that word, okay? And it's the same word that you find used in Isaiah chapter 53 and in verse 4, where it says, We did esteem him strict, stricken and smitten of God. Okay? So it's the very same word that's used when Christ was smitten. Okay? So it's that word naka. So I just want you to see this parallel between the rock and Christ. So you have a full, firm understanding of who he's talking about. We're going to get there in a minute so you have an understanding of everything we're going to talk about. Okay? One more place of scripture I want you to go with me to is 1 Samuel chapter 17. Again, another very familiar story. Everybody has read it. It's probably one of the most famous kid story that uh, they teach in VBS in Sunday school the story about David and Goliath. There is such an incredible parallel and picture of what takes place with David and Goliath for the power of the cross, how the river of God is released, and how the defeat of, of, the, of uh, Satan is pictured in this with the battle between David and Goliath. And I need you to grab a hold of this. Now go with me there to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and look at verse, I turn my right page, verse 49. And David put his hand in his bag and took a stone and slang it and nakah the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his faith in the earth. So the devil, represented by Goliath, is smitten. Okay? Now watch. <clears throat> Very important thing that I want you to follow along with me. How many of you understand it's not a coincidence that David went to a stream? In the, in the scripture, the word is brook. That word is stretched out, and it can mean a lot of different things in the Hebrew. It could mean a river. It could mean a brook. It could mean a torrential amount of water that is rushing down, or it can mean just a plain river. Okay, so you can interchange those words without any problem. But it's not, it's not coincidental that David happened to go to the brook or the water to get a rock or a stone to defeat Goliath with. Okay, there's lots of different things that go on with this. So this is a picture, again, of Jesus. Remember, Jesus is talked about in uh, Psalm chapter 95 and verse 1. It says that he is the rock of our salvation. Another place in Psalms, it says that he is the chief cornerstone. So we know that who he is. Now, notice here that Goliath, in verse 4, is called the champion. Okay, he's called a champion. Do you know this guy? He was like close to 10 feet tall. I mean, his, his spear was like a weaver's beam. That thing got to be like, you know, like the tree that hit you in the head the other day, Cindy, just about that big around. Okay? And, it's, it, I mean, this guy was so monstrous. He was so big. Okay? He was the Philistines' champion. In other words, he was the champion of the things of this world. Okay? That's what he was a picture of. And notice that Jesus, I'm, I'm sorry about that, David takes a stone to defeat the, the giant. And where does he defeat him at? In the forehead. 
Remember Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 says that the seed of woman, talking about Jesus, it's the first prophetic message about Jesus is Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 says that the seed of woman shall bruise your head, talking to the serpent. So here there's a stone coming out of the brook. You notice the parallel between the rock and the, the water here that crushes the forehead of Goliath who happened to be their champion, who happens to be, like Satan, the greatest enemy of God and man. You follow that? So we find that is Goliath represents a picture of the greatest enemy of God and man, who is Satan, that David also represents our greatest champion, Jesus Christ. Remember that Jesus was the son of David. Hallelujah. Follow this parable. So this drama that's going on, it happens to be a prophetic picture of one of the most pivotal points of history in all of mankind. And I'm going to show that to you right here so you can grab a hold of this. Okay? Number one, look, at me, look with me to verse 8. Remember that Goliath had a challenge. The champion of, of the world out there throws a challenge to God's people. Remember back in the garden when Satan tempted Eve and she submitted to that temptation. Both Adam and Eve at that point committed high treason with God. If I can put it this way, they sold out to the devil and walked away from God at that point because they got in agreement with the devil. And when they got in agreement with him, they empowered him. They gave him authority over their lives. You need to understand, when, when people do that, they give authority to Satan over their lives in whatever aspect that is. When you get out of agreement with God, there's people who are out of, agree out of agreement with God today where the Word is concerned, where the baptism of the Holy Spirit is concerned, where healing and miracles, signs, wonders, and those types of things, they're out of agreement with God. And when they do, then they empower the devil for different areas of their life. When they don't agree with God about healing in their body, they will end up sick. When they don't agree with God concerning prosperity, they end up broke. Come on, let's, let's face it. There's all things that people get out of agreement with God and they empower the devil and then they wonder why their lives are upside down in so many areas. And you empower him. I would rather empower God on my behalf by believing what his word says. <laughs> right? That's, I think that's a wise deal. Personally. Okay? So here it is. Adam and Eve, they committed treason they delivered their authority, hear me, they delivered their authority over to the kingdom of darkness. Think about that. They delivered their authority. They had all of God's authority. But they delivered it over to the devil because they committed reason. Okay? So watch this picture. Now look at verse 8. And he stood, Goliath, he stood, and he cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why do you come out to set your battle in array? In other words, what's your point? You're going to lose. That's what he's doing. Okay, what's your point? How many have ever heard the devil tell you that? Okay, it's a lie. He says, am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Watch this. And you're going to get this in just a little bit. Remember these words. Underline them. Highlight them in your Bible. Choose you a man. And let him come down to me. You're going to get this in just a minute. This is, this is powerful. Choose you a man. And let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me to kill me, then will we be your servants 
But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. Look at this challenge. Look at this challenge. First, choose your man, let him come down. And then, whoever wins this battle, if you win, we serve you. If I win, you serve me. Doesn't that exactly what took place in the garden? Think about it. In the garden, that's the very same thing. That war with Satan that began in Eden took away our freedom and hung everything in the balance. Took away our authority and hung it in the balance. Remember on, on Mount Carmel, Elijah went through the same thing. They were indecisive about which God that they would serve. Would they serve the God of, of Elijah or would they serve Baal? Remember, there was a great contest, and the God that answers by fire, he be, let him be God. And he said to them, how long will you be between two decisions? The same kind of battle that goes on today. And that battle took place in Eden 6,000 years ago in that garden. And the challenge for freedom that came from the serpent said something like this. I have defeated you, and I have made you my servants, and you will be my slaves unless you find a human that is capable of defeating me. Oh, my. Does that sound like something that took place in the garden? Doesn't that sound like something that went on for 4,000 years? The same kind of taunting? Unless you find a human who is capable of defeating me, choose you a man. And this is, see, he hung himself. Choose you a man. Let him come down. him come down so god had a plan <laughs> hallelujah understand this challenge went on for 40 days for 40 days and you'll, i'll get to that in just a minute but yeah, i need you to remember that for 40 days this taunting went on god already had a plan he had a champion waiting in heaven Woo. hallelujah okay it was the great shepherd, the son of the shepherd David. Notice how this is such parallel. The son of the shepherd David. And listen, Jesus wasn't just rocking in a chair up in heaven, just biding his time. Are you kidding me? He was chomping at the bit, listening to the tauntings of this giant Goliath, listening to the tauntings of Satan, waiting his time. And God had a time and a place for him to be released. Remember Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 says this. It says, when the fullness of time came, that God sent forth his son made of a woman to redeem them who were under the law. There was a time that came in the fullness of time. God packaged up eternity into this microscopic seed. And he planted it into the womb of a virgin. And all of a sudden, the creator entered into creation, dressed in his battle array, ready to pull down the strongholds of Satan and set mankind free. He answered the call that says, choose you a man and let him come down hallelujah and thus he did <laughs> glory to god now there's some things here that i would need you to see i need you to see the 40 days and this will help pull things together 40 in scripture if you remember it is a number that is used for times of temptation okay remember for 40 years the children of israel wandered around in the wilderness. Forty days, forty nights, it rained upon the earth. Okay, And there's so many different other places that you find in Scripture concerning that. But 
If you remember that there are two occasions, two major uh, encounters that Jesus had with Satan concerning temptation. The first one you find in Luke chapter 4 or Matthew chapter 4, whichever version you read, doesn't matter. But remember, for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted of the devil. Do you remember that? Okay. So <clears throat> these two encounters, the first one were the 40 days in the wilderness with, with uh, Satan. And remember, David's final blow, and I'll get back to that in a second, but, but David's final blow to to Goliath was not just the rock in the forehead, but remember that he also took Goliath's sword and he decapitated him. Okay? How did Jesus deal with the devil in the wilderness? With the very same thing that David finished off the devil with in his temptation, with the sword with the word. Remember, he continued to say, it is written. It is written. And remember that the scriptures declare unto us that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing the soul and the spirit asunder and as a, thought, a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So we know that the Word of God and Jesus is the living Word of God. Okay? So he finished him off the very same way that David finished off Goliath. The second encounter that we find is the cross. 4,000 years since Eden until the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Notice the number 40. 4,000 years. Some people think, well, it couldn't be. It had to be 342 million because they found all these kind of dinosaur bones, and this is what science says. No. Go back and do your scripture study. You'll find out 4,000 years since creation to the crucifixion of Christ. 4,000 years later, Jesus on the cross. There's a picture between Goliath and David. Watch this parallel. David went to the brook, to the river. Okay? And what did he gather out of the river? Five stones. Five is a number in Scripture that represents the cross, it represents grace, represents atonement, it represents life. <clears throat> there were five sacrificial offerings in Leviticus chapter 1, verse through 7, that were a picture of the cross. It was the grain offering, the burnt offering, the uh, offering for atone, uh, for peace, for sin, and for trespass. Those five sacrificial scriptures are types and shadows of the cross, the fulfillment of what Jesus did on the cross. No small wonder he picked up five stones out of the river. You follow that? Five wounds were inflicted on Jesus on the cross. His hands, his feet, and his sight. Okay? So when David picked up those five stones out of the brook, it represented Christ, our rock, the cross, and the grace of God. Are you catching this? Which part, Linda? Okay. So when he picked up those five stones from the book, brook, it represented Christ our rock, it represented the cross, and the grace of God. Okay? So, when David killed that giant, it was a type of Christ, what he fulfilled when he crushed the head of the biggest giant that roared against mankind. 
Satan. A complete and total defeat of his authority. Now watch, because you've got to grab this in order for you to understand that this is what God is waiting for the church to get a hold of so those things can be fulfilled. Okay? So with David and with Moses, with the rocks, we have two smitings, but each one pictures two different facets of the same event. They're not separate. They're just two facets of the very same thing that took place, okay? The cross is represented when Moses' stripe was, uh, most, his rock was smitten and the river flowed. And then when David hurled the rock into the head of, of Goliath and the giant was defeated. Now watch how these two come together. When Christ was smitten, remember the river of life flowed out of him. What came forth out of his side? Water and blood. Water and blood. But also, when he resurrected the headship or the dominion of Satan was ended. Remember Jesus said, now is the judgment of this world come and the prince of this world has been cast out. <laughs> Remember, the devil is not the God of this world, this cosmos, this universe. He is the God of this age. Remember, God gave you and I this planet. The heavens, O oh Lord, belong unto you, but the earth have you given unto the sons of men. God in the garden gave the earth unto men. He said to Adam and Eve, this is your place. You need to uh, subdue it. You need to have dominion on it. You're the one that needs to multiply it. You need to be the one who replenishes. You're the one who needs to be in prosperity and health and peace. You rule this planet. I gave it to you. You're to have authority over nature. You're to have authority over everything here. This is yours. The devil doesn't own it. Jesus took it back from him and rolled back the waters of Jordan all the way back to Adam and restored you and me back into our rightful position. Glory to God. And the sooner we get a hold of that, the better we're going to be. He's waiting for us. He's waiting for us to get back there. I want to read some. Go with me to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Now, there's two Bibles I'm going to read this to you out of. One is the Moffat translation. By the way, this one is really special to me. I couldn't even bring the cover in because it's so old it fell off. This was Lola's, grand, um, Lola's mom's Bible. That's old. i got to be so careful with it because it just, you know what happens when paper gets old. But listen, and this is talking about Jesus and his authority. So in the King James, well, let me first read to you out of the Moffat, and then I just want to kind of talk about verse 7 a little bit so you grab a hold of this. This oracle has the eternal for my Lord. Sit throned at my right hand until I make your foes your footstool. Yes, the eternal shall send you from Zion, the scepter of your sway, that you may reign amid your foes, arrayed in sacred vestments. The day you come to power, you are supreme. Vital and fresh like dewdrops of the dawn. You are to be a priest for life. So swears the eternal. His oath will not change. A priest as once Melchizedek was. The Lord is at your side, shattering kings upon his day of wrath. My Lord sends pagans to their doom. I love it. <laughs> Filling the valleys with their corpses. Shattering their chiefs far and wide. He, watch this, verse 7. He drinks from any stream he has to cross. Then charges forward 
triumphing. I like that. You know, he's talking about Jesus there, right? Okay, now watch. In the King James, look at verse 6 and 7. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. The reason I want to read this to you out of this as well, because I, I really like what it says in Moffat's, but I can explain a couple of things here, especially there in verse 6, where it says that he shall wound the heads. Everybody say heads. That's plural, isn't it? Okay. Over many countries. Actually, that word countries in the Hebrew is the word eretes, E-R-T-E-S, and it means over the earth. Okay. He shall wound the heads over, over the earth. That word head is in the, obviously in the plural, but in the Hebrew, it's this word, rosh, R-O-S-H. Okay, it's the word rosh in the Hebrew. And it means headship or authorities. So you need to grab this. He's not talking about the natural authorities. He's talking about spiritual wickednesses in the high places, the principalities and powers, in the prince of darkness of this world. Notice it's not the prince of this world. It's the prince of the darkness of this world. That's the, that's the God of this present age. Notice that he says here that he will do what? He will wound those heads. Where did the wound go? Where did David hurl the rock? Where did Jesus, what was it prophesied that he would do unto Satan? He would crush his head under his feet. And guess what? You are the body of Christ. Come on. Does the body have feet or not? And you are the body of Christ, and you have feet. Therefore, his enemies are your enemies, and if they're under his feet, they're under your feet. Glory to God. <laughs> you get it? So he will wound those heads, those principalities, those headships, those authorities. He shall drink of the brook in the way. In other words, wherever he goes. Wherever he goes. Now watch. Therefore shall he lift up the head. You got to get this. Notice the word head is what? Singular. is the one who is to reign in authority today jesus he's the head of the body read your bible so he shall lift up that head in other words the new authority in the earth two thousand years ago was given to jesus remember all power is given unto me in heaven and earth Jesus said that right after his resurrection. Said it to the disciples. He said, because I now have all authority and all power. It, how many, when you say all power, how much more is there? None. Because all means what? All means all. He said, all authority had been given unto him in heaven and earth. Now you go. So Jesus, who is our head, has now given us his authority in the earth because the God of this world has been judged. He has been cast out. He's been evicted. And the only authority he has is that which you give unto him. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, somebody just said, yeah, your mouth. Man, if you could change your language, everything would be a whole lot better. Got to get from here to here to here to here. Longest 12 inches you'll ever see in your life. 
It's a long road traveled right there. But we got to get it there. Church, I, I hope you're understanding that God is trying to wake his church back up again to say it's time for you to just stop being a social club and doing this. You need to become a house of power once again. A house of prayer, a house of praise, a house that demonstrates the goodness and the graciousness, graciousness of God and the power of God. That the devil doesn't rule this world. You and I are supposed to sit back into our place of authority where he intended for us to get. The world sure is exercising theirs, isn't it? Their wokeness and their perversion. They're listening to the voice of hell more than the church is listening to the voice of heaven. Come on, let's be honest. We need to start listening to what God has to say. So both the rock of Christ, the rock of Moses, or the rock of Moses and the rock of David, listen, has been fulfilled. Now what Acts chapter 3 and verse 18 says? He fulfilled it. He fulfilled it. He rolled it back. And word has come to our rightful place of authority in the kingdom of God. Rightful place. It's time, church, that we awake, 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 awake. And realize that. The river begins at the cross. We want the river of God to flow, the anointing of God to flow. Not only do we want it, we need it. We need to be desperate for it. And understand that without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we're nothing. But it begins at the cross. That surrendered life at the cross has got to take place. And the understanding of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Colossians says it this way, who has delivered us, God has delivered us out of the authority of the kingdom of darkness and has delivered us into the kingdom of his dear son. See, we're no longer under the dominion of the devil. We are now under the dominion of Jesus, our King, thus the kingdom, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. That verse says right there that everything that man was tangled up in, that God set you free from by the cross of Calvary. Everything. Everything. You are not captive to him any longer. Care what kind of lie he tells you? Boot him in the mouth. <laughs> Take the sword of the Spirit and decapitate him. God answered the word of a Philistine giant when he said, Choose you a man and have him come down. To me. Little did he know that he by his own mouth prophesied the coming of Jesus and the defeat of Satan's kingdom. We'll read that. I get so tickled every time I read that verse of scripture. Choose your man. Come on, pick him, pick him, send him down to me. No problems. <laughs> On his way. <laughs> Ready or not. <laughs> Glory to God. Aren't you glad God did that? Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you're the church of Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. His body. Father, I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. That you chose the man, your son, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you that you sent him. 
Thank you that he won the battle 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Father, that you released his power, his authority, his anointing into your body of believers. That we no longer have to stay slaves to sin, but we stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. We're not entangled any longer, Father. We're free by the precious blood of Jesus. We're empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have the word of the living God dwelling on the inside of us. And Father, we will arise to this occasion in this day and in this hour. We're here for this particular purpose in this particular time. Because, Father God, you have set your church to be an ensign, to be a signpost in the world that you are alive, that Jesus is resurrected from the dead, and the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit still sets the captives free. Thank you for that opportunity, Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare to you, we will be all that you have asked us to be. We will become all that you need us to be, Father. Not of our own accord and not of our own will and not of our own understanding, but we will be led by your Holy Spirit. For your word says that they that be the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. So we will be led by you, Holy Spirit. Lead us so that we can also lead. Teach us so that we can teach. And we draw upon that anointing, the power of the cross, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of your word. And we bless you and thank you, Father, that we are victorious, that the devil is defeated. Hallelujah. And we move from victory to victory, from faith to faith, from glory to glory in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Glory to God. God is good. And all the time.